Hey, it's Irreverent Aegis here, and in this video, I bring you the achievement Bane of Relatable, which of course is the trifecta achievement in Veteran Shipwright's Regret. That gets you the title Privateer. If listening to grown men sob and cry is your kink, just talk to Relatable about his two-month prog getting this achievement before he finally decided to bring in me and I Suck at Life to clean this up in just a couple of nights. If you run Mag DPS, the only optional boss in this dungeon worth doing is the first one, the Lost Maiden, as it increases your total magic pool when you complete it. The other two optional bosses end up being more trouble than they're worth, they add a lot of time to the 25 minutes that you have, and it's a lot easier to die on those two other optional bosses than this one. That's not to say that it's impossible to die here, as somebody in this group has proven, but that's besides the point. Honestly though, I'd normally show this really easy boss on 5 times speed, but I wanted more time to make fun of people in the group. On a more serious note, I will point out that the three Maiden minis that pop up in this fight do have heavy attacks that are ranged, so it is very important when the Maiden splits that the tank taunts all three of them to avoid one of those inverted deaths. After waiting forever for this portal to actually let us through, we have one more ad pull before the first actual hard mode boss, Foreman Bradigan. Of course, in this ad pull, it's most important that you taunt the blob if you're the tank, because the blob can one-shot your DPS. And now, we have arrived at Foreman Bradigan, probably the most frustrating boss in this dungeon. As this is a trifecta guide and not a mechanics guide, I'm only going to go over the most important things that you need to do to avoid a group member from dying. First and foremost, we have the Haunter mechanic. When Foreman Bradigan charges at the tank, he'll leave behind four Haunters. One will be tethered to each character in your group. Of course, when you have a Haunter tethered to you, you take a ton more damage from every source. In fact, the tank has to be extra careful about when to bar swap, because even a light attack will kill the tank if you have a Haunter on him. If there are already four Haunters out, when Foreman Bradigan charges again, you won't get any new Haunters. This is great, because it means that you could leave up the Haunters the entire time until after the second charge, and then kill them afterwards. This will prevent you from pushing the boss to 60% and having Haunters up, which is usually pretty much a death sentence, as we do get a Flesh Colossus that puts all of these poison circles on everybody. Having a Haunter up when you have a poison circle will pretty much wipe you. Now, the Flesh Colossus should be burned down as soon as possible. It only took us 13 seconds to kill him because we dropped ultimates on him. After the first Flesh Colossus goes down, that's when we're introduced to the Hugs mechanic. And the Hugs mechanic here requires that two people and only two people stand in the hug. Having less or more will result in a death. The way you do this is the tank and the healers stack on opposite sides of the boss. One DPS is assigned to each of the support roles. So, when the tank gets the Hugs mechanic, the person assigned to him goes and stacks on the tank. Or, if that DPS has the hug mechanic, that person goes and stacks on the tank. The same goes for the opposite side. During double hugs mechanic, which is what usually wipes groups after the second Flesh Colossus, you simply call out switch if two people who both are normally assigned to each other both have the hugs mechanic. While it's still important that this second Flesh Colossus goes down quickly, it's more important that most people in the group save their ultimates so we can execute Forbidden Bradigan really quickly, because things get really dicey during this exit. Not only do we get this double hugs mechanic, which you can see here, but there's also a ton of flame shapers, and we'll end up getting ghosts pretty soon. Keeping a tight stack in your group is really important because Foreman Bradigan will randomly jump to the person furthest away from him. So if you want to make sure all your ground AoEs are hitting, the group should pretty much group up pretty closely most of the time to avoid that jump right there. Other than roll dodging the growing AoE to prevent COVID, the last thing I want to mention is what to do with all of the flame shapers during execute. If you have a necro tank, it's really easy. Just run beckoning armor, and everything's going to automatically get chained in when they start doing their AoE attacks. That will also interrupt them. I don't know if anybody's really going to take this advice, but if you're not running a necro tank, just put on the monster set Swarm Mother, as that has the same effect. 
This prevents everybody in your group from having to worry about those flame shapers. They won't need to get interrupts or anything, unless of course they're right next to somebody, because everything will be automatically chained in. Meaning you don't need to worry about them, which is great considering how much damage they do when the haunters are up. Next up, we have hard mode number two, Nazare, which has been incorrectly labeled by a lot of groups as a tank prog. Tanking this is actually incredibly easy, as I'll explain shortly. It's really a DPS prog and a test in patience. In the beginning of the fight, we're simply going to push damage by dropping the house on Nazare. A lurcher will come up sometime after 80%, in which case the tank simply needs to taunt the lurcher to prevent the lurcher from killing somebody in the group. When Nazare slams the staff into the ground, we get our first dogs phase. One DPS is assigned to the entrance, one to the exit, and it's simply a DPS check here. If the dog is not killed before the AoE gets to the end of the map, the entire group will wipe, of course, so we want to make sure that the DPS is solid before even coming in and attempting this trifecta. Just after 65%, Nazare goes into its blue phase. That might be purple. I don't know. I'm colorblind. Anyway, when Nazare turns bluish purple, she's going to start putting circles onto the ground. When she's inside of them, she goes invulnerable. And it's kind of annoying because even when she's slightly outside of the circle, she stays invulnerable. And you need to pull the boss out a little bit further than where you think you might need to. Now, a lot of tanks die during this phase, and they die a lot, and that's for several reasons. One might be that you have a bad healer. Two might be if you get heavy attacked when the boss is standing inside one of the blue circles, it hurts a lot even through a block. And if the lurcher just happens to have the big dot on you and you get heavy attacked, the damage can be well over the amount of health that you have. But the real reason that people die a lot during this phase is simply because the DPS are impatient and they say, get her out of the circle or something like that. So that leaves the tank to walk backwards really far, hoping that Nazare will chase after the tank quickly. But the problem is, if you get too far away from Nazare, she will hit you for about 45,000 with a light attack that you can't really see or prepare for. So the goal is you actually just barely stay away from Nazare so she follows you out of the circle. If you get too far away from Nazare at any time, she will hit you with that attack, leading to pretty much an instant death. So if your DPS are nagging you that the boss is still invulnerable, just tell him to shut up and be patient and she'll get out of the circle when she gets out of the circle. Honestly, this boss is not that hard. It's mostly the DPS being able to do enough damage during dog phase and them avoiding a lot of those AoEs that can one-shot them that happen throughout the fight. With these last few ad pulls before the boss, the most important thing is that everyone waits for the tank to grab the Storm Atros, as the Storm Atros will pretty much one-shot anybody named Killer in your group. One skill that I highly recommend that the DPS and the healer run for this final hard mode is Race Against Time, because during the kite mechanic on this fight, when there's a lot of green circles on the ground, hitting Race Against Time will remove the snare from the green circles, allowing people to run away from the AoEs during kite really easily without having to worry about getting hit by them. It's important that when pulling this boss, everybody in the group stays far away, as sometimes Numero will charge at somebody right before the taunt is applied, and they need to be ready for the roll dodge, so they don't accidentally die, ruining your perfect run to this point. Numero himself is not a difficult boss, but there are a lot of mechanics that need to be paid attention to. This first is the kite phase. When the boss teleports across the map, He's going to put these growing AoEs on the ground. The group needs to make sure that they separate from each other, as all of those AoEs will stack up next to each other, and you don't want to accidentally kill somebody else with your circle. Second, of course, we have these drowned corpses, and the drowned corpses put green blobs on the ground that damage and that apply a snare. We also have the tides that go out. The tides can be blocked and they can be roll dodged through, but they will stun you. When the boss gets to about 84%, he goes off the screen, 
and we end up getting a drowned hulk in the corner. The most important thing to do on this hulk is stack in the corner and stack really close to the hulk. If you get too far away from the hulk, the hulk will turn around and charge at somebody and will keep charging until it's pretty much able to one-shot slap that person. So, if you just stack in the corner and let your heal heal through the green blobs, you can avoid that entire mechanic. So, stack and whack, that's going to get the job done. During this kite mechanic we're about to get, pay attention to how the boss is swinging his arms around like a white girl who doesn't know how to dance. Pay attention to that, because during execute, the boss will start doing that, but will not teleport across the map first. Now another move that he's about to do, which is less dangerous, is instead of swinging his arms upwards, he's going to do another terrible dance where he swings his arms downwards, and that blows up the green blobs on the map. Now, this is less dangerous because this can simply be blocked by the DPS. It does not need to be gotten out of entirely. As the tank, there are a couple of notes I'd like to mention about positioning. First, after one of these kite mechanics, if you are far away from the boss, he will gap close to you, and at the end of his gap close, he is going to hit you with a knockback ability that can't be blocked. So, you will get knocked back. The best way to avoid this is simply to get close to him so you don't need to worry about it, or simply to roll dodge his charge as soon as he arrives at your location. Next, regarding positioning, he does do an AoE conal cleave, so make sure you face the boss away from your DPS and healers, that way you don't accidentally kill them. That should be obvious, but at the same time, they need to pay attention and make sure that they are also not on the same side as you. At 40%, Captain Numeril is going to leave the arena once again, but this time, the Drowned Hulk will appear instantly when he leaves. I am going to pull Captain Numeril to this corner immediately, right after his last kite mechanic, because when we get him to 40%, I don't want our group to have to replace all of our ground dots. I want them to already be there so we can get an early burn on the Drowned Hulk. When this second Hulk phase starts, we want to kill it as soon as possible, so we're going to coordinate our alts to drop him quickly. We can ignore the second Hulk in the other corner, as he doesn't do anything unless we aggro him. But, Captain Numeril is going to come out before this Hulk dies, and that's when things get pretty hairy for the tank. The tank has to be able to taunt him, avoid the charge, possibly get the bash, and roll dodge the ground slam that's a stun from the boss. In addition, he has to make sure that he calls out when the kite mechanic is starting, because that will instantly kill somebody if it's not called out and somebody misses it. Once the Hulk goes down, things become a lot less hectic, as the tank doesn't really need to worry about a whole lot of things. It's really just those first 10-15 to 15 seconds that are particularly dangerous. If that Hulk goes down and everybody survives, from here, it should be a pretty easy clear to the finish, as long as the two white girl dance move mechanics are called out. While I have some time, I'll explain the answer to a question that sometimes come up, and that is, should you worry about the drowned corpses and killing them throughout the fight? And for the most part, the answer is no. They can be killed during kite mechanic in the first two phases before execute, because there's a little extra time to do so. And when the boss teleports away at 40%, you might have time to kill one or two as well, but for the most part, just stack in the corner, kill the Hulk, and that'll get the job done. If you liked this video, please feel free to leave a comment or hit the like button. And if you want more content like this, feel free to hit the subscribe button. I'm glad that I suck at life and I were able to prevent Relatable from going into a spiral of depression, and I hope that you stick around for a couple Easter eggs coming up.